Hello everyone, welcome back to the series where I share my tips on how to build an alien ecosystem from start to finish. Today we're covering prokaryotic ecosystems. Prokaryotic organisms, also called prokaryotes, are those microbial life forms which do not have a nucleus. They're the most common form of life on Earth and easily outnumber all other life in terms of individuals. But prokaryote-like organisms don't get a lot of love in speculative evolution, which tends to focus on bigger, flashier, multicellular organisms. I have nothing but respect for those projects, but there are good reasons not to overlook the simpler microbial organisms. For one, they're most likely to be the first life forms that come to dominate any planet in the universe, so the story of any alien biosphere necessarily starts with them. In the last episode, I showed you how to world build a last universal common ancestor. Today we'll be taking it from there and giving you an idea of how that first organism might diversify. Let's begin with what a prokaryote is and how it's built. At its center, there's a strand of genetic material, called a nucleoid in Earth prokaryotes. It stores genetic information and is replicated during reproduction. It also produces RNA, which is single-stranded genetic material that you can think of as instructions for building proteins. Ribosomes read this RNA and convert it into the accompanying proteins. Proteins then swim around in the cytoplasm, which is basically just a pocket of water enclosed by a cell membrane. The cell membrane, in turn, is just a layer of lipids that you can think of almost like a slightly stronger soap bubble. Small chemicals can pass through it, while larger chemicals like proteins cannot. The cell membrane is reinforced in most species by a stronger cell wall, which seriously hampers flexibility but increases resilience and makes it easier to keep the inside and outside separate. When a microbe wants to reproduce, it simply splits into two identical copies, duplicating its genetic code in the process. This is called binary fission. But where does it get the resources to do all of this? The easiest way to think about these kinds of organisms is that they're like little machines that take in one kind of chemical, under certain conditions, and output a different chemical as waste. That's called the organism's metabolism, and is responsible for generating energy. So for example, breaking glucose with oxygen to make CO2 and water, like humans do, is a kind of metabolism. There's a separate process which also falls under metabolism, in which the organisms produce their own food. For example, photosynthesis in plants, which turns water, CO2, and light into sugar. When an organism breaks down its food into energy, it can then use that energy to create complex biological molecules required for its growth and reproduction. To do this, microbes require access to chemicals for building those biochemical structures and molecules. This can include carbon, phosphorus, nitrogen, and many metals depending on the species. If a species acquires these chemicals from inorganic sources, it's said to be fixing that chemical. There are many different kinds of metabolism, and to understand them, we need to get into a little bit of chemistry. The way you get energy out of chemicals is by oxidizing them. To do this, you need another chemical, which gets reduced in the process. In this way, you can think of oxidation as the opposite of reduction. When we break down a sugar with oxygen, we are oxidizing that sugar and we are reducing that oxygen. Oxygen is the strongest naturally occurring oxidizing agent, and so in oxygen-rich environments, it's preferred by biology. In environments without oxygen, things can get more diverse. Some examples of oxidizing agents include sulfite, carbon dioxide, and nitrite. With some chemistry knowledge, you could very easily create your own custom metabolisms for your alien microbes. Unfortunately, that's out of the scope of this video. So for those of you like me lacking chemistry knowledge, here are a few interesting anoxic metabolisms on Earth. A process called methanogenesis is used by some archaea to produce energy. They take hydrogen and carbon dioxide and turn it into methane and water. However, this requires hydrogen to be available in the environment. Another process called sulfur reduction is used by some bacteria. They take sulfate and break it into sulfite, which can then be used as an oxidizing agent. The final waste product is hydrogen sulfide. This metabolism was a lot more common in water without much oxygen, which is rarer to find today. Finally, some bacteria even use iron as an electron acceptor, in this reaction. They're considered chemolithotrophs, meaning that they derive their energy from rocks. But you may be more familiar with the categories heterotroph and autotroph. Autotrophs produce their own energy from inorganic sources, and usually fix their own carbon from the atmosphere. Heterotrophs, on the other hand, get their energy from organic molecules like sugar, so they typically don't have to fix their own carbon since they can get enough from their sources of food. As you can imagine, autotrophs, whatever their source of food, be that light, rocks, or chemical gradients at hydrothermal vents, form the basis of the food chain. Around them, communities of microbes will develop to exploit the conditions of abundance created by the autotrophs. 
This pattern of microbes creating conditions for other microbes to thrive is also common with anaerobic species, which often live under a sheath of aerobic species that use up all the oxygen that is otherwise toxic to them. At its logical conclusion, this results in an arrangement called syntrophy, where one organism's waste is another's food, or where one organism's metabolism enhances another's. In the first episode of my Alien Life Form series, I covered one of the microbial communities on an Earth-like planet, and I'll be referring to it to provide examples of how the principles I'm outlining can be applied. Let's break down the chemical economy of the community I described in that episode. As you can see, the basis are these two photosynthetic species. Then, there are these supporting species. One fixes nitrogen, one anchors the colony, and another metabolizes excessive oxygen. They all receive their carbohydrates from the photosynthesizers, either directly through symbiosis or indirectly through leakage. Finally, we have the two species at the top of the food chain, which primarily act to cull the microbial community of its weaker members. They're entirely heterotrophic and don't fix anything. All of their food comes from the other species in the habitat. None of them are doing this out of the goodness of their little microbe hearts, of course. They're simply making use of resources that no one else is and specializing to be better at exploiting them than anyone else. In biology, this is called a niche, which refers to the role an organism plays in its ecosystem. If two species try to occupy the same niche, they fall into competition, and one usually goes extinct. So how do these species adapt to their niches and outcompete their rivals? At the microbial scale, particularly in prokaryotes, adaptations are more often chemical in nature rather than morphological. For example, their cell membranes or cell walls may evolve to become more impermeable to certain toxins in the environment, or they may become more fluid to survive in colder climates. Their metabolisms might slow down in environments with low levels of food. In fluctuating habitats, they may evolve forms of dormancy, where they slow down their rate of biological activity until food returns. One of the most extreme forms of this is called encystment, in which a bacteria will slow down its metabolism to a complete halt, remaining as only genetic code and a few proteins in a tough shell. This arrangement is called a cyst and has evolved many times on Earth. Bacteria also wage chemical wars against each other by producing targeted antibiotics, among many other mechanisms of attack, including puncture. Relatedly, here are all the ways that a microbe can die, with the notable exception of starvation. But while chemical adaptations play a major role in microbial evolution, physical and morphological traits are also important. Prokaryote-like organisms may evolve structures on the outside of their membranes in the form of pili. These are used for anything from gene transfer, to toxin injection, to adhesion, or even a crawling movement. Flagellar structures are also important for motility. They're long, tail-like structures that are crucial for swimming. Due to the relative simplicity of prokaryotes, convergent evolution is quite common. That means that the same or similar adaptations can evolve independently in unrelated lineages. On Earth, there are two main groups of prokaryotes, archaea and bacteria. Their primary difference is in the structure of their cell membrane. Bacteria have a less resilient but more permeable membrane, supporting faster metabolisms, while archaea have a less permeable but more resilient membrane, making them excellent at specializing in extreme conditions. But both domains have evolved membranes which resemble the capabilities of the other, in an example of convergent evolution. In my alien life forms video, I discussed the two domains on my planet, where one used silica heavily while the other didn't. With so much bioavailable silica, silica handling proteins evolved independently even in the non-silica using Zanarian clade. So when designing your domain system and general taxonomy for prokaryotes, remember that the traits of lineages tend to be more like guidelines, with exceptions to every rule. Finally, I want to talk about bacterial predation. On Earth, most predators which prey on bacteria are eukaryotes. But there are a limited number of examples of bacteria which prey on other bacteria. Bacterial predators usually take on parasitic forms and tend to be smaller than their prey. For example, Vampirovibrio is a bacterial predator that attaches itself to the cell membrane of another prokaryote and then sucks out their contents. Delovibrio, on the other hand, invades the cytoplasm of its prey and then reproduces within. Like I mentioned earlier, however, all of this is more of a guideline than a rule, and it's entirely possible for the predator to be larger than the prey, consuming them through phagocytosis. Phagocytosis of entire cells is rare among prokaryotes, but has evolved at least once in the Asgard archaea on Earth. Phagocytosis is the process of enclosing another cell in your own membrane, which requires sophisticated membrane folding control that doesn't arise easily, but it's not unlikely that one or two lineages on your planet may also develop this adaptation. This adaptation in particular is important because it's the cleanest way for a simple prokaryote-like lineage to transition into a complex eukaryote-like lineage. 
In the next episode, I'll discuss the transition from prokaryotes to eukaryotes and how it can happen on your alien world. See you next time.